Hey, Mark Heim here, founder of Disaster Doc. Going to talk to you today about disaster planning. In particular, we're going to talk a little bit more about monitoring and evaluating a disaster plan. As I mentioned previously, the ADEPT system uses the ACT planning wheel that includes five phases. And one of these phases involves testing the mission area plan. In our case, testing the emergency operations plan or EOP. That's where we'll focus now. First things first, allow me to clarify what I mean by monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring is a continuous prospective assessment of ongoing plan activities. We're looking towards the future. It measures progress, helps to solve current problems, and measures performance of ongoing EOP activities. Evaluation, on the other hand, is a discrete retrospective looking backwards. It's an assessment of past performance. It measures the outcomes and helps to prevent future problems and measures the outcome of past EOP objectives. Comparing monitoring to evaluation, we see that monitoring measures the inputs and outputs of emergency response activities while evaluation focuses on the outcome. Monitoring allows us to be more efficient during the response. Evaluation allows us to be more effective at the end of the response. In essence, we recognize each activity as one process. We use the SOAR model to define the plan activity, and an activity we also call a process. Then we use Six Sigma to measure analyze, improve, and correct the activities so that we can ensure that events conform to the plans that we've been given. The ADEPT planning system integrates with the Six Sigma DMAIC model. The DMAIC includes steps for defining, measuring, analyzing, improving, and correcting EOP activities to ensure that these events conform to the intended EOP outcomes. And the first step after defining the activity, once again at that activity level, is to measure it. We use the SOAR format to define the activity, and then we identify ways to measure key indicators of the plan performance itself. The first step in measuring a process is to identify indicators of performance. And using key performance indicators, also known as KPIs, we can compare our observed performance to some standard or reference. The ADEPT system uses the emergency operation plan itself as the standard. It's the gold standard that we're comparing our performance to. All activities performed during the response are then compared to those that were actually written in the plan. Efficiency is a key indicator of plan performance and performance measures of efficiency include uh, process efficiency, that's the number of EOP activities that can complete, be completed per resource that's utilized, and also it can involve productivity, the number of EOP activities that have been completed per hour. KPIs are used to measure our performance. In this table, the KPIs for response inputs, outputs, and outcomes are listed in dark bold, with their associated performance measures listed as bullets under each KPI. We see now we can track KPIs using these observable measures of performance. Effectiveness is another key indicator. It's an indicator of overall EOP performance. Performance measures for EOP effectiveness include the number of goals and objectives that may be successfully accomplished, and it can also include cost effectiveness, the number of US dollars that are spent for each outcome. Now, I know what you're going to say when I tell you that I'm going to talk about math. <laughs> But not, let's not get caught up in the details or caught up in these formulas. The main thing that I'd like to show you right now is that we can analyze emergency operations using a few math tricks. Service delivery as compared to product defects are measured using statistics that describe variations from a norm or a standard, like we said, the EOP. 
We then depict variations from the EOP in charts that can allow us to look for patterns. Examples of performance defects can include things like a lack of completeness or lack of timeliness. We can also describe performance defects in terms of efficiency or user satisfaction. Process control analysis is a statistical method used to evaluate the control of a process. For example, during response operations, managers may suspect a high degree of variability in the performance of one activity that's been detailed in the EOP. They may then collect additional information and analyze a bigger sample of data about that particular activity. This includes multiple trials of the same activity, not just one drill or one after action review as we've often done in the past. The ADEPT planning system integrates with the Six Sigma DMAIC model. The DMAIC includes steps for defining, measuring, analyzing, improving, and correcting EOP activities to ensure that events conform to the intended EOP outcomes. There are two main steps in process control analysis used by Six Sigma. Step one includes screening for any obvious signs of variability in performance. We call this the run chart that's on the left. Step two on the right includes measuring the extent of any variability in performance that you may have already identified. One of the first things that we can do when we're trying to measure an EOP activity is to look at the run chart for that activity. Run charts are simply graphs that display the observed performance of the activity over time. We then look for unusual patterns or wide variations that may represent defects in our plan or maybe our ability to carry out that plan. Process control charts, on the other hand, are a type of run chart, but they measure variability also taking into consideration the size of the sample, so a better view of our accuracy. It measures the degree of error represented as these upper and lower control limits that we see uh, here in yellow in this figure. But I'll go into more detail. The Six Sigma process control chart is constructed to represent upper and lower control limits shown in these red boxes. These limits form the boundaries for what is considered to be an acceptable and unacceptable degree of variance. Events outside of the upper and lower control limits represent processes that are considered out of control and warrant corrective actions. And project improvement actually leads to process control. Once performance indicators and metrics are evaluated during process analysis, decisions can then be made regarding improvement. Goals to reduce variability among these EOP activities can then be addressed and focused on those that are found to be out of control. As mentioned previously, the ADEPT system uses the ACT planning wheel that includes five phases. One of these phases involves testing the mission area plan. In our case, testing the emergency operations plan. The final step is to improve, then control, the variation that we've discovered during our analysis. Once defects have been identified during the process analysis and corrected during process improvement, the principle of preventive control is applied through actions that control future variability and uncertainty. Process control is the system of checks and balances that managers use to reduce variability so they can ensure reliability and validity of their work. Emergency managers use process control to re reduce variability and uncertainty during the implementation of the EOP. This ensures outcomes conform to the EOP. A hierarchy of process control offers a layered approach for controlling the process at various levels. The highest priority is given to the most effective control and that's at the top. The intent of this hierarchy is to establish preventive control over performance and that variability of the defects. In other words, prevention through design. This hierarchy includes five layers of controls, elimination, substitution, engineering, administration, and resourcing. 
The first priority of hierarchical process control is to eliminate the defective process altogether. In the case of emergency operations, stakeholders would simply delete the activity from the EOP. The corresponding objective would either be accomplished by using a different tactic or the objective itself would also be eliminated. When it's not possible to eliminate the activity, stakeholders may instead substitute another activity in its place that will accomplish the same operational objective. Whenever substitution is not a viable alternative, stakeholders can then engineer or maybe change the design of some activity to allow for less variability and, and less uncertainty. This involves targeting and reconvening of affected EOP stakeholders and then discussing these same issues again. Now, where activities may not be amenable to redesign, stakeholders can then choose to change the way that the activity is administered. Activities may involve the coordination with external resources that augment or replace stakeholder capacity. It may also involve intensive coordination of internal resources as well. When administrative controls, once again, aren't adequate, stakeholders may then choose to change the way the activity is resourced. By changing staffing, funding, timing, or the logistical support, we can add additional resources that require stakeholders to balance the effectiveness with efficiency. They have to be mindful of the cost. Resourcing is often the least effective and the most difficult option to sustain. Resource controls create recurring costs and require the most ongoing maintenance as well. So they are therefore the least sustainable when it comes to extending this applicability over time. So the future of disaster planning is actually automated in my opinion. Machines will write most of the plans in the future. For this reason, disaster planners should become at least familiar with a little bit of artificial intelligence. And one of the many reasons why I think machines are so adept, pun intended, uh, is that computers are able to think more rationally than humans and they don't get caught up in a lot of the other subterfuge of emotional issues that come into play when we try to plan. It's now possible actually for EOPs to learn from their mistakes through computing and make rapid improvements in near time that will ensure preventive control of ongoing operations using process control theory. It is now possible for machines to compare field-based progress reports to the actual standard of the EOP. System may also then affect changes in the environment that will result in the intended objective accomplished through actionable intelligence. That, my friends, is artificial intelligence. We need to build intelligent planning systems. Sensors that include clocks, speedometers, two-way radios, telephones, accelerometers, and GPS all connected by the internet. In order for machine learning and AI to occur, we also need actuators that reach out and do something in the environment, reach out into two-way radios, smartphones, and reaching out by the internet. The ADEPT planning system is designed to bridge this gap between strategic policy and technical practicality, as well as the gap between anecdote and evidence. And once again, it uses artificial intelligence to try to predict the future disaster events and our readiness to manage them. Stakeholders may now convene, even virtually, to assess, plan, check, prepare, and test mission areas using the most up-to-date approaches and technology. They can build their own libraries of data regarding effectiveness and efficiency of plan execution. And ADEPT-style capability libraries can also now be shared and analyzed from all corners of the world to be applied at the macro EOP level, as well as the local micro IAP level. There's no longer an excuse for misguided or uninformed plans. From our measurement comes certainty, and from our certainty comes success, and from our success comes everyone's safety. 
And I leave you today with one final challenge. It's not good enough to do good. We must do good well. And to do good well, we must plan.